Hello everyone, my name is Loco, and welcome back to another high-level match of StarCraft 2. Now what I've got for you today is something special. It just so happens to be that these two, they faced off in a best of three series just a couple of weeks ago, and it happened again. Historically speaking, these two pro gamers, they really don't face against each other very often at all. But since they're the number one, as well as the number two in the world, and they really have been for like the last three, four, maybe even five years or so, it's always exciting. It's always fireworks whenever these two play against each other. Now our Zerg player here, he's from Finland, he's opening up with a 15 supply hatchery after an extractor trick. So that is before making an overlord, that is a little bit funky. I'll talk about that in just a little bit as well, we're gonna go for another extractor trick. Okay, playing right here with the blue Zerg drones, we're looking of course inside of the main of Serral, and his opponent in the opposite corner from South Korea, the number one Terran in the world, playing right here with the red Terran as CVs. We have the man who really has been dominating the Korean StarCraft 2 scene for quite literally a decade <laughs> we're looking at none other than maru's main command center okay maybe a decade is a bit of an exaggeration because he's not that old yet right it took him a little while to really get the hang of playing at the absolute highest level of starcraft but there's no denying that maru has been good for the longest time Alrighty, now are we gonna be going for the double wreck start? It looks like we aren't. It's just gonna be a single barracks right here on the low ground, so this may very well trick Serral for just a moment, as a lot of the Korean Terrans have been opening up with the double wrecks right here. Yeah, inside of the natural expansion. Now, real quick, normally, Zerg players will go for an Overlord at 13 supply into a 16 supply hatchery. So that means they make 16 drones and then eventually they make a hatchery on the low ground. This is a 15 supply hatchery. Before making the first Overlord, he gets that one additional supply by making an extractor, starting up a drone, canceling the extractor, and then eventually he made that hatch on the low ground. Long story short, this is of course a little bit safer. The main difference right here for the Zerg is that these queens, they will come out about 12 seconds earlier so 12 seconds is quite significant because it means you can usually skip zerklings if you want to against a reaper opener from the opponent now already we're playing some rock paper scissors here because there is no reaper opener as a matter of fact maru right now is hunting overlords but serral has decided to send his ovies in some very interesting directions this over here I mean, it's not really scouting anything for the moment, but if Hellions start roaming the map, there's a very good chance that they will be running around that way. So at this point... Hold on, actually, my cat wants to leave. <laughs> okay, I'm back. He's gotten very respectful, not actually meowing into the microphone. Instead, he's just, you know, twirling around my feet. Anyways, um, we've got these Zerklings over here on the other side of the map. Serral at this point doesn't know what he's playing against, and neither does Maru. Turns out, though, neither of them really is playing something absolutely crazy, but these build orders, they're pretty uncommon. Both of them are pretty uncommon, and it's gonna be an interesting clash. Maru actually prioritizing the Orbital Command here. He fired up two Marines already, but decided to cancel those immediately, as he will now restart them after getting that Orbital Command going. Alrighty, now, I'm excited to cast this series, first and foremost, because, well, it's Serral versus Maru. I'm a big fan of high-level StarCraft 2. And, uh, yeah, I uh, always enjoy watching these two face off against each other, because it doesn't really happen nearly as often as I would like. But also, because I've been sitting on these replays, they were sent over to me probably about a week or so ago at this point. So, I actually just got back from a short little vacation. I, uh... Spent about a week in uh, in Spain, actually, together with my girlfriend. It was an absolute blast. We did a whole lot of nothing. So I'm feeling excited and recharged to get back into the swig of things. But this is quite literally the first pro game of StarCraft 2 that I've seen in about a week. And obviously, I haven't casted any games either. So <sighs> I did play a couple games yesterday, though. I did play about a dozen, eh, maybe not a dozen, maybe like eight or so ladder games yesterday on stream. So that was, of course, a lot of fun. In case you're unfamiliar, I stream pretty much every single day over at twitch.tv slash locotv. I always kind of feel like a lot of people don't quite realize that, but besides making these YouTube videos and having the second YouTube channel and all that too, I do also stream probably about 40-ish yeah, hours a week. You can find me over at twitch.tv slash locotv. There's a link down below. If you hit the follow button over there, you'll get notified whenever I go live. Now, what in the world's going on here? Is this an aggressive build right here from Serral? No, it's not. He's decided to go, so this is a very funky opener. He's decided to go for a quick triple hatch opener after a 15 supply hatchery on the low ground. He skipped the Zerkling speed upgrade, and he's decided to go straight into Roaches. Roaches are one of those units that can be used as a timing attack, but in 2023, more often than not, whenever we see the pro players go for Roach openers, it is to try and simply not die to anything stupid. Right? This is the I don't want to die to anything dumb build. It's pretty good overall, 
but it does mean that the game is gonna go the distance. And for the vast majority of the Zerg players, they don't really enjoy that very much. You can, of course, go for timing attacks as well after the initial Roach Warn. So you can go for like a 1-1 one, one Roach speed timing attack, something along those lines. Most of the time though, someone like Serral, he will not be going for anything like that. And we'll instead see him play a macro focus style. The thing about Roach Ravager is that, in my mind, it's it's a late game, it's, it sounds weird, but it's like a late game opener, okay? So with, for example, a Ling Bane based army, you can go Hydra Ling Bane, right? You can really focus on going for mid game attacks. Usually, Roach Ravager, it leads towards a much faster hive. Usually players will opt to go for a much quicker uh, infestation pit and go straight into a hive and maybe into lurkers or a variety of units that well, they can choose from at that hive tech, but generally speaking, this is a much more passive opener right here from the Zerg, so yeah, he's even gonna go for the missile upgrade, so I think that's exactly what we're gonna see in this game. No Baneling speed, no Zerkling speed, not even a lair yet, but we'll probably see a Hydra then and a Lurker then here in the near future, and it really does mean that, well, Maru gets to decide the pace of the game. What exactly has Maru been up to so far? Well, you can see he's only got 47 workers compared to the three base saturation of the Zerg. So he's finally adding on the additional gases over here. He does have a third command center finishing up. But yeah, this really is an opener where Terran wants to deal some sort of damage. Because if you don't, you really do start falling behind. He's killed two drones, sure. He's killed a couple Zerklings, sure. He's gotten himself an Overlord or two, fair enough. But none of that is really going to slow down the Zerg very significantly at all. With an opener like this, Terran really is hoping for a bit more damage, and this may very well be the start of it. Yeah, the Roaches decide to stay there. That's mostly because half of them... Okay, they were already split off in the main base. I mean, last time I casted Serral versus Maru, I spent basically the entire video fanboying over how good Serral is. I'm gonna try and, well, someone quote me out in the comment section below. It's not, it's not a big deal, okay, I don't really mind. But yeah, I did get a little carried away, um, you know, nerdgasming all <laughs> over Serral's moves, because the guy is looking ridiculous right now when it comes to the Zerk versus Terran matchup. You can see already, right? So he had the perfect amount, like that's what's exciting to me. He had the perfect amount of roaches over here to contest 16 Marines, and then at the same time he had Units already sitting there, right, in the main base, to push back a drop that would be coming up. Even at this level of play, oftentimes I find that Serral is still... If it would be like a game of chess, you know, he's still like one step ahead of the opponent, strategically. Like, maybe Maru is thinking like six steps ahead, but Serral would be thinking like... He would be thinking like eight steps ahead, you know what I mean? Like, it, it doesn't feel like it's the biggest difference in the world, but it really strategically always feels like Serral is very on point. Now, does that make him flawless? Of course not. Pro gamers are human. And when it comes to the Terran versus Zerg matchup, Maru is absolutely excellent. But so far, he definitely is at a deficit. Yeah, there's that Hive coming up, pre-eight minutes. There's the Lurker then coming up as well. Now we're finally finishing up the Zergling speed upgrade, and Maru is just now going into the second factory, so... You can see here that economically Maru is not in a great spot. Army-wise, he's got a decent amount of units, but tech-wise, he also is quite far behind. He's gonna have to get something done with these units soon. The problem is, as soon as Lurkers hit the battlefield, especially when the Lurker ranged upgrade is done, which does require the Hive, of course, and that's one of the reasons why we do see the Hive so quickly, once that upgrade is done, it's gonna be incredibly hard for the Terran player to push with a Marine-based army. At that point, you really need to start adding on the Ghosts. So, at this point, Maru is adding on additional barracks here. We'll probably see a Ghost Academy here very soon as well. He's already going into Liberators. Now, that is something interesting. So, we have seven Metavex here in total. Yes. But he's already gone into the Liberator play. Hmm. Normally, we don't see Liberators quite this early. This may be like a, an evolution or maybe something that Maru is doing specifically against Serral. But here's that Grooved Spines upgrade coming up. It's gonna make those Lurkers shoot at significantly more range, and it makes it very difficult for the Terran to engage with a Marine Marauder tank-based army. So are we gonna go for Tech Labs over here? I think that's what we need, Maru. Tech Labs over here. He's a bit... You, you can see it's just... It's a little less... There you go. It's it's a little less tidy, right? If you compare it to Serral's playstyle... And I know it's, it's only a few seconds, right? It really is... Are we gonna go for a drop? What in the world are we doing here? Why are there suddenly, uh, why, why, do we, why do we have the March of the Overlords? Okay. 
Apparently he got scanned, mostly because the the, <laughs> the bench. Yeah, no, we are gonna go for a drop alert. Okay. So seven drop alerts are coming up right now. I mean, Maru did certainly see that those overlords were marching in a strange direction. You know what? This may actually backfire. Oh, once again, this was mostly just for him clearing out some creep. At the same time, though, almost feels like those overlords were bait, although he really didn't need to morph them in if that were to be the case. At the same time, there is a push going on over here. Is he going to be able to kill the planetary fortress? I don't think so. No, he is not going to be able to shut down the planetary, and that is a major win right there for Maru. That being said, he did lose 14 SCVs in the process, but he did not lose the command center, and he didn't really lose any of his heavy hitters. At this point, when the command centers are done, it's pretty easy for him to rebuild those workers. 14 SCVs at the two-minute mark is very different than 14 SCVs at, well, 10 and a half minutes into the game, right? Or maybe 10 minutes into the game. It's much easier for him to rebuild it at this point. All right, so the siege tank production continues. So does the Liberator production. So how many libs are we on right now? Only two. How many did he lose? He only made two? Interesting. I feel like I've seen two Liberators on the production tab for the majority of the last few minutes, but apparently we only produced two in total. Anyways, Liberators and Ghosts are coming up right now, and that army composition I like much better here. Fungal Growth tried to slow down those Metavex, and okay, we even get a little bit of a Chain Fungal as well. That's going to be the end for those Metavex. Pretty painful, especially because, yeah, he was just starting to use the Starboard for that Liberator production, so he has to switch back right here to a couple of those Metavex. Lurker drops, heading on over towards the main base of the Terran player, or at the very least it's an option. And I think he believes he's been spotted, and he may just be right. Already a couple of Vikings patrolling over here. Uh, Sarah is thinking about checking, but... Alright, Marines over here, going to the 12 o'clock position. It's only a small group of Marines, but these are properly upgraded, and... With plus two, they're gonna be able to finish up that hatchery pretty quick. Okay. It'll be softened up, and... It'll definitely be a target for some future attacks as well. These four bases, though, of the Terran are very difficult to push into. Yeah, with properly positioned units, how in the world is Zerk ever going to engage into this? I think Serral's best plan here is to almost soft contain the opponent of four bases, right? So basically try to never allow them to get a fifth base going. So the fifth base is going to be either over here, which is way far away, or it's going to be over at the bottom, or you can just run into the siege tank lines. I was going to say, maybe that's a little bit overly ambitious, but this is, of course, another expansion as well that Terran can choose. At the same time, those Marines still go into town on the other side of the map, getting eight drones in. Not bad whatsoever, but, of course, same deal as we saw earlier for Terran at this point, so we can easily replace them. That being said, this is uh, the moment, right, that Terran players love. There it is. Additional command centers are coming up, factories are already building, we've got a tactical nuke on the production tab. This is Maru preparing himself to play a proper late game, and in order to play a proper late game as Terran in the current meta, you need about a dozen command centers. Alright, so they're coming up right now. A lot of additional infrastructure has been put down. I think the pivotal moment in this game is gonna be very soon when Maru will attempt to take a fifth base. There's a chance that Serral doesn't even really bother with attacking it because he's got so many bases himself and obviously he's preoccupied here trying to uh, put out all these fires of the Terran drops that are going around, but it's gonna be tricky here for the Terran to take that fifth base. It's gonna be important soon though because the main is gonna run out on minerals very soon and the same could be said right here for the natural. Look at all these SCVs. Already, uh, yeah, quite a few of them are dedicating. It's nice to see these drops, right? And they're getting a little bit of damage done. All right, we're gonna drop on the little Reaper ledge right over here. The real question is, how is he going to secure a fifth? Tactical nuke flying on over towards the bottom left. Now these drops, I mean, they have done quite a bit of hurt. They're still putting in a bit of work as well. Okay, I was gonna say, killing these larvae is actually well worth it. Yeah. That's like 13 larvae or so down the drain there for the Zerk, which I believe is the maximum amount of larvae that a, uh, is it 13? I think that's the max that a hatchery can hold, although I might be completely wrong. I know that changed the values at some point in the past. But anyways, Benchy over here, by the way, this is the Benchy from the early game still. Absolute Giga Chad. I mean, he may die, no, 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 yeah, no, he did die. 
Okay, anyways, that guy must have been responsible for at least half of those creep tumor kills that we see right over there. Maru now attempting to go for that base over here in the top right-hand corner, and this is... Yeah, I think already actually a little bit too late. Not really something that Sarah can do something about anymore. Too late for the Zerg player. I mean, uh, he's, he's gonna try and push in over here. Hoping that maybe Terran pulled a lot of the units here for the defense away from this location. And he may just be right, although this is the Ghost Army once again moving on over here. I mean, the Imperial March can continue playing, because <laughs> these Ghosts are gonna be more than happy. Fungal Growth is gonna be attempted at the very least to scare off some of these units. Lovely play right here, though. We have the Siege Tanks under a little bit of threat, and this is a good trade right here for the Zerg. Getting rid of these Roaches, it was about time. Getting rid of these Roaches and exchanging them for Siege Tanks, definitely something that the Zerg player will like, but there it is. The Planetary Fortress at this point has finished up, and that is, of course, the key right here for Terran when it comes to securing this location. At this point, of course, the Siege Tank production is well underway as well. We've got ourselves the uh, Infernal Pre-Igniter coming up. We've got the Plus 3 coming up, so that is going to one-shot Zerklings regardless with the health, uh, the Hellbats, that is. So it's going to be really good here for the Terran in just a few moments. And you can see that despite the early game, right, and it really didn't feel like it was going Maru's way, this is something that Maru does better than any other Terran player out there. He's very good at not dying. <laughs> I know that's a strange skill to have, but it's much easier said than done, okay? Yeah, just just don't lose, right? Just don't lose and try your very best to play the late game. Much easier said than done. All right. Didn't really like the early game for him very much, but we're no longer in the early game now. We're not even anymore in the mid game. Instead, we're now playing the late game. Now, don't get me wrong. This is still an excellent position here for Serral but not quite as comfortable anymore as it was earlier. All right. He's trying his best to move forward. But look at how Maru is controlling the map, right? I think this is one of the most impressive things. Nice snipes once again, coming up. Okay, good. One of the most impressive things that Maru does is play the maps. And this sounds very obvious again, right? I, I'm apparently Captain Obvious today, but he does a... He does a I'm sorry, lads. He does a very good job at playing each of the maps a little bit differently when it comes to putting down his infrastructure. And he changes it as well from game to game. So it's not like every single game on Babylon he's going to be positioning the structures in the same way. Is this a good fight for the Zerg? I mean, those Brute Lords are putting in a lot of work. I guess it's working out better than I anticipated with all those Bane Links occupying those, those ghosts, right? Those ghosts were running away. As soon as the ghosts, though, are once again on the hunt... Yeah, that is going to be the moment where Zork decides to retreat until the reinforcing bangers come in. Even the queens right now have been pulled towards the front as well to lay down a few tumors and to transfuse a couple of those broods. But these fights, not nearly as good for the Zerk as they were earlier on in this game. If you look right now at the units lost and the resources lost, more importantly, you can really tell that Terran has been trading a lot more efficiently. And now with the, yeah, the, the Brute Lord surprise spoiled... It's gonna be the factories right now that will be producing the Thors. So Thors, of course, outrange Brute Lords in their high impact mode. So they really do need to switch over to the alternative weapon. But once they've got that going, life's gonna be good. Now, Maru's trying to secure this base over here up north. This is exactly what Serral's trying to prevent. And he decides to pull the trigger as he wants to just simply roll his Banes straight through this army. Again, trying to make sure that those ghosts are on the run. And then in the meantime, the Brute Lords and some of the leftover Zorklings and Hydras, they can clean up a couple of those Siege Tanks over here. And that will make it... Like, the, the Siege Tank is sort of like the anchor, right? You need them out in order to push back those Zerk units. And it's going to make this base a lot more vulnerable. That said, though, there's a lot of Terran armies still available. There we have the Fusion Core coming up. So Maru not too excited when it comes to making that transition. I like that, actually. It's very easy to jump the gun. There's another tactical nuke. Love that. That tactical nuke is effectively gonna buy him like half a minute. Right? So that's all he really needs right now. He needs to secure this low ground once again. And love that zoning nuke. I actually think that's one of the best use cases for nukes. I mean, obviously, everybody dreams of getting that golden nuke on your opponent's army, right? Oftentimes, not gonna happen at this level of play. But using them for zoning and to buy a little bit of time, I think that's very clever. Fungal Growth, trying once again to get into... Oh my god, okay, some, some big Zerk moves over here. Blinding Clouds go down, and now the Banelings and the Zerklings are starting to run through. These ghosts don't really have anything buffering for them anymore. Same for the Thors. 
There's really not a lot of Hellbats to be seen. And you can see that Panic right now is well underway as Mr. Maru accidentally hits the wrong hotkey as he starts up a bunch of Reapers. Or this is going to be the sickest late game transition that I've seen in my life if the man actually <laughs> decides to go back to Reaper play at this point. That would blow my mind. I have never... No, that's got to be a misclick for sure. All right. Ghosts once again are dying though, and this is pretty painful. Hatchery, by the way, in the meantime, at the 6 o'clock position. This is normally going to be a location where that command center wants to land. This planetary fortress, in the end, is not going to happen. And that's what the Zerg player has been fighting for this entire time. But it's been expensive. Yeah, a lot of Zerg units have gone down here over the last few minutes. Massive fungal growth, by the way. Can he capitalize? He cannot. Okay. Beautiful, elegant transitioning right here for Maru, right? Like... The way he does that transition from Marine Marauder Medivac into what is effectively Ghost Mech. So, Ghost with Siege Tanks, Hellbats, Thors, and all the rest of it. It looks easy when you see these top-level Terran players do it, but nobody does it better than Maru. It's very easy to get, under, or to get caught in the middle of the transition, right? We see that all the time. I casted a game not too long ago where the Terran was trying to make this transition. I think it was Gumiho on Altitude? Anyways, once again, big fight over here. Blinding clouds go down, fungal roads go down. Beautiful engagement here by several, though. Getting so much value out of his spellcasters, but that big coal cave right here from Maru is mitigating a lot of damage. And... All right, this time around, it's not gonna be a planetary fortress. Instead, it's gonna be an orbital comment. A little bit easier to, well, fly away, but also a little bit more difficult to actually secure. Several made this base quite a long time ago at this point, but there's still some juice remaining. If Maru can clean up this area of the map and take that base, that would be fantastic. Okay, moving forward once again. There is that aggression as well, currently in the middle of the map. A couple of Brute Lords here nibbling away at whatever they can. But Maru still is holding strong in this location. Saro at this point no longer maxed out. He's getting close to maxing out once again, but he did have to smash his piggy bank for it. And that is something worth noting. This is no longer a Zerg player who can easily just remax over and over and over again. He still has a lot of income, especially compared to the Terran. So if you look at the income graph over the last couple of minutes, you can really tell that Zerg has been ahead in that department. But Maru has now secured what I almost consider to be the impossible basis here. The one in the top right, a little bit of a Zergling run by apparently, as well as the one even further to the left of that. These are very tricky bases to acquire. Now, this little Brute Lord Zorkling counterattack is getting in an awful lot of value. This is where a lot of that production of the Terran is located, right? Brute Lord's over here, just poking wherever they can. I thought the age for the Brute Lord was over, man, but apparently Serral disagrees, just using them to be as much of a distraction as possible. Is he giving up on this location? It almost feels like he is. But I'm not sure. No, I think he's making himself up to collapse on top of his army. That's exactly what he decides to do. Siege tanks, though, in the back. They need some blinding clouds as well, but the EMPs have been solid. And there's no energy anymore right here on the Viper. I think that must have been an EMP anyways. Bird Lord here continue the harassment at the bottom of the map. I saw additional dropper lords coming up. Are we going to drop queens? Or, like, what are we going <laughs> to... I'm not sure what the advancement in the, uh, is over there. But, yeah, I was going to say, this base... Beautiful moves right here by Maru. This base is going to disappear. 23 minutes into this game, and it's still very difficult to say who's actually ahead. All right, apparently it's going to be the Liberator who has been tasked. Yeah, the Brute Lords were thinking about turning around, but this guy is kind of like a sentry. Doesn't really deal that much damage. Zerklings, though, getting so much value in. This is something that I feel like we don't see that often at this stage in the game, but those Zerkling backstabs are actually putting in so much work. All right, reinforcing Hydraling Bane, by the way, a much faster army to reinforce with, and also not really one that Maru seemed to have expected. Yeah, it's gonna push back this base, and now there's a pesky Zerkling burrowed underground as well. But the Terran mech army now is moving forward towards the bottom. 33 drones? All right, that's a little much. Yeah, and you can see that things are starting to get a little bit desperate right here for Saro. The reason why I think that Maru did not expect <laughs> uh, the Hydraling Bane transition is because Hydraling Bane is a composition that is great when you have that tempo, right? When you've got that income. 
At this point, Serral doesn't really have the income anymore to continuously support replacing a lost Hydra, Ling, and Bane. Right, so obviously this is Vipers and Infestors in the mix as well, so this is not quite your average mid-game Hydraling Bane army, it's also fully upgraded, so these units do certainly pack a punch. Okay, I was gonna say, I feel like we have something more in store though, because this wouldn't make a lot of sense. 14 Corruptors are coming up. But that's the last money that Sero effectively has for now. He needs to secure another base. Alright, apparently the mineral line here up north is once again acquired. Terra now though, Maru here, is taking the base at the bottom of the map. Serral sees this, but I don't think there's really a whole lot he can do, although he does have Neural Parasite. Raven coming up, love that. Big fan of the Raven at this stage in the game. Multiple Ravens are very powerful, although the main problem you can run into, and I've seen this happen once before, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of Terrans are hesitant to go into Ravens, you can Neural Parasite them. So I imagine Zerg Neural Parasiting a Raven and then throwing an anti-armor missile on the ghost or on the mech? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would be a disaster. And I think that's one of the reasons, at least that's what Terrans have been telling me, one of the reasons why they are a bit hesitant to make that late game Raven transition. But hey, you gotta make sure that you use every single tool at your disposal when you're going up against someone like Serral. And it's a risk you're gonna have to take. Marauders are being sacrificed right now. They're going to be replaced with more supply-efficient units. All right, here's the Brutalord transition once again. Keep in mind, though, that Zerk still has had more mining throughout this game, right? And that's really the strength of the Zerk in general. Whenever they have all of this mining going on, they can also afford trading inefficiently. So the income advantage has been a roller coaster, but you can definitely tell that it's been at the advantage of the Zerk over the last 10 minutes, and really over the last 20 minutes or so. Zork is actually more like the last 25 minutes, I think. Ever since the hatchery first. Uh, it's, it's been a Zork advantage as far as the income goes. And that is what Terran is always fighting against. That's the real battle that's going on. It's not even so much the units, it's the economy. Alright. Planetary Fortress is going to be coming up over here at the bottom of the map. Brute Lords, though, are advancing in the top right-hand corner, and this is exactly where the Terran player doesn't want to be right now. Because immediately, look at that movement on the minimap. These Brute Lords are distracting the entire Terran army. Terran army is coming in over here. Brute Lords are retreating. Zorklings are taking care of a couple of siege tanks, and they're going to prevent this planetary fortress. Well, I think they could have prevented it at the very least. Instead, he's going to settle for some more SCV kills. Lovely movement, though, here by Serral. Now that Maru is in the top right-hand corner, he's like, you know, what? I'm gonna go ahead and move forward once again. EMP over here on some of those infestors trying to push them back. And even though Serral does get a base at the bottom of the map, he also loses a hatchery over here in the top right. So it's an eye for an eye, but with the man, yeah, who's got bigger, he's got a bigger economy right here overall. I think that's a trait that Serral will be happy to take, especially if he can now steal one of the bases that the Terran was trying to acquire. Plus, he got all of those siege tanks as well. The Zorkling backsteps actually in this game have been super significant. It's a little difficult to quantify how many units they've actually killed, but they must have killed a few thousand resources worth of valuable units, whereas the Zorklings, I mean, I wouldn't say they're free, but yeah, for all intents and purposes, Zorklings, you can definitely afford making them at this point in the game. It is kind of ironic, by the way, that this game started off with Serral not making the Zorkling speed upgrade, and normally that wouldn't lead to a game where we have maxed out Zorklings later on. Anyways. Brute Lords have come to finish the job. And they will. That planetary fortress is gone. Another tank loses its life. Lings and Banes over here are getting some value in as well. Okay. And apparently the Brutes are not even done yet. Hatchery over here at the bottom of the map has been destroyed. The Dropper Lords that were morphed in a while ago are gonna try and get on out of here. But Maru is once again trying to secure this base. And this time around, I think he's got a much better shot. Although Serral is thinking about going on over in this direction as well. He's parked a Overseer here to see if that base is going to be reacquired. Expansion in the bottom left is going to be destroyed, but that one's not very important anymore. Because, oh, well, he's actually cut off right now from his main retreat path. This could actually be a disaster right here for Maru. Oh my god, yeah. These units, they have nowhere to go. Okay, well, he killed the hatchery, but it came at the cost of a bunch of those marauders, a bunch of hellbats, a few medivacs as well. 
Here come the ghosts once again, though. So 19 ghosts at this point out on the battlefield. I actually think the Thor count should be much higher at this point. Maru, though, at this point doesn't have the resources anymore. He really needs to saturate these gas geysers, and there we go. Make sure that he gets the gas income once again, because that's the resource he's lacking. He's only at 165 army, or sorry, 164 supply here in total, 120-ish army supply. That is gonna be... I don't think that's gonna be enough. This is so much Zerg, even the Queens right now have come to the front. Massive fungal growth right here as well, and all of those ghosts and the chain fungals are indeed landing. Of the 19 ghosts we had earlier, only seven of them remain. There's a nice abduction as well into the spore crawlers. Maru needs to max out. He's got 1,800 minerals. Well, at the start of that sentence anyways. He has a lot of minerals, but he hasn't actually spent it on any army units here in quite a while. Yeah, he's making hell bats. Those only cause minerals, but I wouldn't mind seeing even a transition back towards, well, oh my god, even a bunch of marines. There's a blinding cloud on top of a Thor that was neural parasited. That looks like one of my games whenever I try to get fancy. But it turns out okay right here for Cyril as the blinding cloud was just about to wear off. That was an amazing fight right there for the finisher. And now he's driven Maru into a corner. Maru has now successfully spent his gas bank as well. But the problem is, what in the world is he going to do against this massive amount of Zerg? This expansion over here, it's been around for a long time. It's running out. The expansion in the top right-hand corner, it was destroyed some time ago. Serral has now taken one of those bases that was previously mined by the Terran. And he's gonna do the same as well to this base all the way in the top right-hand corner. That was the fifth of, well, Maru that we saw him taking, like, I don't know, 25 minutes ago? Maybe a little less than that, but quite a while ago. This now is effectively the lifeline of the Terran. He still has command centers, so the SCV count doesn't really matter all too much. But the downside of mining so much with all those mules is that you also run out of the mineral fields really rapidly. Alright, Maru is going to have to put all of his eggs in one basket. Sarah knows it, which is why I think he's playing a little bit more passively right now. He doesn't really know exactly how much money Maru has. He doesn't really know exactly how much mining Maru has. But I think he's reading this game strategically very, very well. If he can prevent the Terran from taking one more base, all he needs to do is clean up one more Terran army. Maru starts up the slow push right here in the direction of those Spore Crawlers. They put in quite a bit of work, actually. Serral thinking about pulling the trigger once again, but he can't really afford it. I was gonna say, pulling the trigger right now would be dangerous, because while Maru doesn't have a lot of money, Serral is not maxed out, and he doesn't have that much income either. Still ahead when it comes to, well, mining compared to the Terran. But it's not like he can just push up towards this high ground and then instantly remax. That's not one of the options that he has at his disposal right now. Maru's eyes are set on this mineral line, I think. Yeah. He wants to fight this Zerg army head on, but it's gonna be very difficult to do that off creep without those spore crawlers and the queens. Okay. We need more Thors, though. I don't think we have enough Thors. Okay, there's a snipe going down, but not going to happen with the Funk Growth connecting. If Maru can push back this Zerk army and take this base, he's gonna be in a good spot once again. Good EMPs over there, but he does end up getting one of his ghosts fungled. And that's gonna be the end of that ghost. None of the infestors at this point don't have energy, so he's gotta be a little bit cautious here. All right, SCVs are starting to move on over towards that left side here. We're probably gonna have to fly a command center. Okay, it's gonna be the old main base. The old trustworthy main base. The one that we started the game off with. It's gonna be sent on over towards this expansion over here, and it's gonna be pivotal. An absolutely critical base here. If he can secure it, I think this mineral line is gonna decide the game. If he can't, however, I think Zerk will probably win. And Serral's been slowly maxing out once again. Adding on more spellcasters, and he's now also sent drones on over here. My god, these two fighting each other is always such a treat. Massive blinding cloud shutting down the majority of those siege tanks. Hydras with a beautiful arc as well. Brute Lords just raining the Brutelings from a distance. Maru has been slapped away from this position. And look at Serral backing off. Not taking the bait to engage deeper onto the high ground. He realizes exactly the game he's playing here. Like, StarCraft 2 is always a game with incomplete information. And keeping your head cool 
while you have very limited amounts of information, is very, very tricky. And I think that's honestly what separates Serral from other high-level Zergs. It's not necessarily his micro and his macro, which of course is excellent. It's the strategic understanding. Turns out StarCraft 2 is a strategy game. I know, crazy. <laughs> crazy concept. All right, well, it's not over yet, though. Maru is now mining some of those minerals, but so is Zerk. Look at them. They're both sharing a mineral line. That's love. Although I don't think they're experiencing it as such. Vipers do have a little bit of energy here. They may go for some more blinding clouds or maybe even some transfusions. Lift on the command center just barely in time. More and more mules are starting to fall, though. 12 Zorklings are apparently gonna be what we're smashing our piggy bank on at this point. Serral now, okay, he's forced to commit since the ghosts are lining up their snipe. Massive blinding clouds once again shutting down pretty much all of the siege tanks. The control of these spellcasters is glorious, although that massive EMP right there from Maru was really good as well. Shutting down the infestors. If those infestors were not shut down here, I think we would have seen neural parasites on quite literally every single Terran unit that's remaining. Because we have, yeah, we had like 10 infestors or so, and about Terran, uh, Terran units also in total. The Zerg mining continues. Terran has run out. At this point, if we look at the mineral income, 27 minerals coming in every minute. Zero minerals coming in every minute right now for Maru. Serral doesn't have a lot, but he's got a lot more than zero. Some might even say he's got infinitely more than that. Although some minerals right now are being returned once again. What a battle. The Infestors at this point don't have any energy. Two ghosts end up dying here, by the way. The Infestors are taken out of this equation, but I think there's just too much, sir. Lovely game of StarCraft 2. Game number one of this best of three. It goes in favor of Serral. Alrighty. That brings us to the map Neo Humanity. In game number two in this best of three. I bet some of you forgot that this was a, a series. <laughs> we weren't even watching a, a single match right here. Although, that previous game definitely could have been a video all on its own. Anyways, game number two. Maru once again opting to go for the low ground. I wonder if he's gonna go for the double barracks opener. Serral once again opting to go for the 15 supply hatchery on the low ground. It's interesting to me how it's only Serral at this level of play who seems to be a fan of this build. He does it against Terran as well as against Protoss, whereas none of the other top level Zergs actually play this build. Like, I've seen a few of them experiment with it a couple of months ago when Eric was first finding some success in the ESL Open Cups. The Brazilian Zerg Eric. For some reason, Serral decided to stick with it, and none of the other top level Zergs have. So, it's interesting. Yeah. Like, we've run the numbers. We know the most optimal way to open up in StarCraft 2 after, believe it or not, 13 years of competitive play. Although, obviously, in the early days of StarCraft 2, we didn't quite start with the same number of workers, and obviously a lot of things have changed as far as the meta and the map sizes and all that goes. But generally speaking, the 16 supply hatchery into an 18 gas, 17 pool is the most efficient way for Zerg players to open up. Yet Serral has decided, you know what? Screw efficiency. I don't need it. Double barracks opener this time around for Maru. This is something that the Korean Terrans have been very fond of. This is something that was invented. Ah, don't want to call it invented, but it's something that Bjorn popularized. Maybe that's a better word to use. Uh, Bjorn has been playing this build a lot. He said it back then. He said, yo, everybody's going to be playing this soon. And it turns out he is right. At the very least, as far as the Korean Terrans go. Although I've seen it I've seen it pop off a little bit more as well on the European server lately. A lot of players are indeed enjoying this Triple Reaper start. It is a little predictable as far as the mid-game follow-up goes. But in general... So it pretty much always leads to watch a marine-based mid-game. But, I mean, every Terran build in the current meta leads to watch a marine-based mid-game. So maybe that really isn't much of a surprise. Battle mech at this point... Hello? Okay. Battle mech at this point, not very popular at all. Although, you know, <laughs> if the upcoming balance patch has anything to say about it, I think we'll probably see it quite a bit moving forward as well. Anyhow. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's tricky for the Zerg player to figure out exactly what the follow-up is going to be, because it can be just, well, straight marines into Metavex, it can be a Benchy opener, it could go into Psych... Like, there's, there's so many different varieties. Maru will probably go for the most vanilla flavor. He might mix in a Benchy, but if I were to make a guess, he'll probably go into Metavex. I think that'll probably be what he decides to go for, but... One big advantage, of course. Oof, that sucks. He loses one of the Reapers. One of the big advantages here for Terran is that it's difficult for Zerk to take a third base. So Sarah has decided, look at that, to skip Zerkling speed and go straight into a lair. This is not something that Maru has seen. What? <laughs> Sarah has completed the game. He's only completing side quests now, okay? He's completed the main story of StarCraft II a long time ago. So he's now being, he's playing two base lair with a Roach Warren. Is this an optimal build? No, not even close. Was that creep tumor any good? No, not even close. Really? Oh, we're gonna take the forward hatch. That's what we're gonna do. All right. Well, with three Reapers, maybe Maru could have contested it, but at this point, not going to happen. Are we gonna go for the big switcheroo or are we gonna make Hellions? Yeah. So we are gonna go for the most vanilla version of this particular strat. All right. So triple command center right here for Maru into... Oh, what? <laughs> Hold up right now, what just happened here? Maybe he took offense to me calling him vanilla. That wasn't, that wasn't an insult. I'm pretty damn vanilla myself, okay? Well, that was weird. <laughs> All right, a little field trip right there for the factory and the starport. But in the end, they return back to their old location. Maybe it's upon seeing this hatchery location that Maru decides to make that call. Although I think he probably just autopiloted. Either way, um, it's triple gas here, which is kind of interesting. That's a lot of gas income at this point for a Terran player on this amount of production. We'll have to see exactly what he decides to do. Now, he does believe he's got the units here to kill that hatchery. Yeah, and he may just be right, although there are six roaches coming up. Six more roaches, that is. Apparently, four are already done. I was going to say, those roaches on the production tap are not going to be in time. But maybe these units will still be enough. Very dicey situation here. Losing those marines, though, and not getting the hatchery would be a disaster. Okay, he does get the hatchery there in the end. Was that worth it, though? Seven marines for a creep tumor and a hatchery council? Spoiler alert, it's not. I think now, yeah, maybe Serral has just decided to just go for a two base all-in. This is the oldest Zerg build order. Obviously, we have Ravagers as well that we did not have in the early days of StarCraft II, but just a good old two base roach attack? Okay. We don't have any upgrades, there's no Evo chambers or anything like that, but I think Serral's looking at this game right now, he's like, yo, bro, you, yeah, killed my hatchery, but I really don't need it. I have two bases saturated, I've just got a whole lot of stuff. How in the world are you gonna stop this attack? And especially if you have a Widow Mine transition, right? Like, Widow Mines are not the unit you need over here. Saving grace right here, though, for Maru is that he is gonna finish up... Okay, sorry, there's the Widow Mine drop. Oh, no. Ooh, 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 ooh. Nice crisis management there in the end. Uh, saving grace right here is that Stimpak is done, so that's nice and all. But this is still a massive Zerk army knocking on the front door, and Serral's holding down the drone button. He didn't mean to make this an all-in, I don't think, but the Widow Mines may have just turned it into one. Are we gonna go for a big attack? Are we gonna commit? I mean, we have a contamination right there on the factory to prevent any additional siege tank production here for at least a little while. Love the positioning right here on these engineering bays, though. It makes it difficult for the Ravagers to get in range of the siege tank. But anyways... The engineering base here are very exposed at the bottom. These two may finish eventually. Okay, this is where the Stimpak button gets pressed. Is there enough firepower though here for the Terran player? I just don't believe there is. I mean, he may be able to stabilize and he does have triple CC, right? So that may very well be nice, but in the end, there's just too many Roaches and Ravagers and it's Serral who wins an amazing game number one and a very aggressive game number two.